This is Devin with Writing Daily. Every day we get together and we talk about things that writers care about, whether you are finishing your screenplay, writing your novel, writing a letter to your grandmother. We're covering the bases on everything writer, writerly, and hopefully you're going to get a lot out of it. My name is Devin Galladay. I'm the editor-in-chief of In the No Traveler, and I am also uh, the uh, author of the forthcoming book, 10,000 Miles with My Dead Father's Ashes. And today I have a friend, a colleague, a talented writer, and somebody who's actually in my writer's group, and I've been trying to get her on here for like a little while, and we finally were able to coordinate it, Pamela K. Johnson. How are you? Welcome. Thank you for Thank being you. here. I'm doing well. Oh, good. I'm so glad. So, uh, and by the way, if you like what we're doing, whether you're watching us live or whether you are, uh, you know, joining us, you know, at some point out in the internet, please ask a question. We'll get to them and uh, make sure that you are writing better. I'm going to kind of turn over just so you know who uh, Pamela is. Uh, and I'm going to read a little bit of her bio, which is impressive and extensive. Veteran journalist Pamela K. Johnson is a former senior editor of Essence Magazine. As an author, she co-wrote Santa and Pete, a novel based on a legend that Santa had a partner. You'd imagine that he would. Uh, was adapted into a 1999 CBS TV movie starring James Earl Jones and Hume Cronin. In 2000, Pamela co-edited Tender Headed, a comb-bending collection of hair stories. The book became the basis of a stage play. In 2006, Pamela wrote and directed Talk Me to Death, a comedy short about rampant cell phone use at a funeral. In late 2006, she received a Woman in Film General Motors Emerging Filmmakers Grant. In 2007, she was selected one of eight of nearly 200 applicants for the AFI Directing Workshop for Women and shot her short film Stitches. In 2009, Pamela won an Artist Fellowship from the Arts Council of Long Beach. In 2010, her office spec script came in second at Scriptapalooza's uh, TV writing competition. And in 2013, she won a prize in the Right Beijing competition and shot a short film in China. I don't even know where to go with that. You are an accomplished, <laughs> you are an accomplished person, my friend. I, I, I didn't. See, I see why you told me to cut it to a hundred words. I, I, I should have, uh, <laughs> should have followed your direction on that one. <laughs> well, but so here we are. But so we know who you are. You are an accomplished writer, director, talented person, uh, and you, you're out to do it. And so I love that. And I think what we're going to talk about a little bit today, if that's okay with you, is that I know that you've been working on a novel. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah, the novel is based on the life of Hattie McDaniel and uh, kind of starts off looking at uh, her coming to Hollywood after a bunch of other things have failed. She's prone to the stage or she's interested in being on stage, but the only thing that's really happening during the Depression is movies in Hollywood. They're really starting to take off. And I think as a result of the depression, a lot of people were like, hey, I want to go to the movies. I want to have an experience that takes me out of this funk, you know? So her career really kind of takes off from there. And it's about, it's kind of about second chances. And it's also thematically about a woman trying to live her life as an artist. Mm -hmm. and, and so Hattie McTano, this is a historical fiction piece. Is that correct? It is. And so for, for those people who may not know Hattie McDonald's by right. name, I mean... I've, I've only been living with her for all these years, so, so I'm like, oh, you know, I know Hattie. But <laughs> Hattie was uh, most famously known for her role as Mammy in Gone with the Wind. And a lot of people have seen her in that scene where she, if, if you've seen Gone with the Wind, it starts off with her kind of... Uh, binding uh, Scarlett O'Hara into that corset. 
And so she becomes really, you know, sort of iconic for this role in part because she's the first African American to win an Oscar for, um, you know, for anything really. And for she won it for a best supporting actress uh, role. And, um, but there was so much more to her life. And I think that's a part that people don't really know uh, that she was one of 13 children, most of them most of them did not live to adulthood, or maybe about half of them lived to adulthood. And they were artistic, and they put on plays, and they, you know, they had their own little sort of troupe, and they kind of were the cakewalk kids, and then they put on, you know, a theater piece, and, you know, the brother opens a, a theater for people to, you know, to perform. And so they just had a lot going on, and I think that she was a poet, and a storyteller and a blues recording artist. And so a lot gets lost when you become kind of iconic for a particular role that you played. So she was, she was kind of like you. She had a lot of things to accomplish. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's why I gravitated towards her because I wanted to uh, tell a story about a black woman artist and the effort that it takes if you're not going to sort of use art as the thing that you fall back on, but the thing that you really put your full self into. And, you know, and she had her ups and downs and work sometimes as a domestic and, you know, and had to just make things work. And um, a part of what I was telling you that I was interested in talking about was endurance because you have to endure as an artist, you know, you have to keep coming at it and coming at it and coming at it. And I think you don't, you don't get affirmed, I think in the same way, like if you're, I think of my, um, the guy who does my taxes, like every year people go to him to get their taxes done. You know, you go to the dentist, you don't have to prove yourself. You're an artist, you're consistently having to turn things out, prove yourself. And I think that, you know, Hattie felt that pressure and she also felt the pressure of staying within the money earning zone with art. You know, like she was blues recording artists starving. She was working in a club. It went under. So it was kind of balancing out um, your quest to be an artist and your needs as a human being, you know, making sure that you're, um, taken care of in the ways that you can. And so anyway, circling back to endurance, um, I have been working on this uh, since many years. <laughs> uh, I came upon it, I came upon, um, a, a, and have written actually a lot of stories around it. Oh, sorry. That's all right, the show, the show goes on. Situation going on, what's that? <laughs> the show goes on. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, that will play out momentarily, so apologies. Yeah, so I'll, I'll scoot over there and uh, turn it off. Should I scoot or just... No, just, let's just keep going. Okay, we'll go. All right. So, yeah, so I, I know I've used the word endurance because it just takes a lot, you know, and I actually, interestingly enough, up at a, a Dorland Mountain Arts Colony at a retreat, a writing retreat right now, where um, I am working on my novel like hours and hours a day and sometimes hours during the night uh, to aim with my aim of getting this last draft of which there have been many, many, many done by, uh, by this August. So looking to wrap it up. So, so what, if, if you don't mind me asking, obviously you've been working on it a very long time. Is there something in particular that you are looking to feel or sense to know that you have told the story to your satisfaction? I think, I think that's why it's taken me so long is because there's a, a, a character in it who's kind of her nemesis. And so I told it, you know, one chapter him, one chapter her, back and forth. That didn't quite work. I started from the beginning of her life, the beginning of his life, went all the way to the end, too much. So I think the process of really getting much more acquainted with my story is kind of the reward of the endurance. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't just this kind of thing where you land in a heat, but 
there every every step of the way, every iteration of it I've written. I've written it as a screenplay. I've written it from his point of view. Every one of those adventures that felt like maybe it was the wrong path, or what the heck am I doing, or you know, this is you know, this this is first person, third person, all these different things really help get into the pocket of what the parameters of the story are, what she's going for, the amount of him that I need in the book. So um, I think that all the suffering has been, you know, um, I don't know. If, uh, yeah, there's been some suffering. Let me be honest. But I think that all that I've put into it, <laughs> all that I put into it has led me to feel a level of certainty that I'm like really, you know, kind of in the final stretch with it now. And, and starting to look at, you know, what I'm doing for an agent, you know, and just that whole quest to take it from being this creative project that I've been working on to something that I share with the world. So do you think that, because I speak to a lot of artists, I, I'm sure you do as well, and I think there is a sense that you just have to churn it, churn it out. Do you, do you know what I mean? Like you just have to move on to the next thing. And honestly, most, most of the, the writers that I am inspired by are the people who took a little bit more time than less. But you have any thoughts on this, this idea of just kind of like, you know, because it, it sounds like you probably could have finished this project, you know, years at some ago. point years ago. Um, I mean, do you have any misgivings about, about waiting for your own appreciation to to gel within the project? No, I don't. I feel that I I feel like all the time spent is reflected in the in the story and how I'm able to tell it in my understanding of this person, of my understanding of the times, of how to take what was going on in 1930, the 1930s and 40s and how to you know, communicate it so a generation that's reading it, you know, almost 100 years later can get a feeling for what these people were going through. So I think that it was, it was almost like an education that I had to invest in to understand better who these people are, why their story mattered. Um, and it's something specific to these folks, but it's also a very universal story about people, you know, on a quest to really uh, do what it is that they uniquely are called to do in the world. And I think that the, that the piece is, a much, is much richer for it. And I also have this, it's, I think maybe because I'm up at an arts colony right now, I have this vision of my mind like it's a drawing with watercolor. So my, in my insecurity, I might have tried to overtell it and over, you know, go longer and do this and be faithful to Taddy McDaniel. Oh my God, she has living relatives, you know. A lot of, lot of things on my head that I had to kind of release. And I think that that image of the drawing with the watercolor is, I'm doing a sketch of her life. I'm doing a section of it. It's not the whole thing. It's not the whole story. People before me have told, told her story. Somebody after me will tell it. Somebody will tell it on screen. There, is, there are more ways to tell it, but I feel like I have arrived at the way I'm going to tell it, and I'm close to, you know, writing the end. Have you, you know, in, in working on this project for so long, um, I'm realizing I look totally orange. I don't know how the heck that happened. But that said, you've been working on this project for years now. And so is there something in particular that you have learned either from the life of Hattie McDaniel or at, from yourself as a writer throughout this process? Yes, I think that I, I, I think on an emotional level, I had to displace a lot of fear and who am I to tell this story and doubts and I recently started getting some coaching, um, this woman named Sean Tollison. Um, and a part of what she was saying was that I needed to like have more butt in seat time. So I've been spending like an hour and a half, almost daily working on the piece, sometimes three hours. And I think that the, the presence, my presence, my attention to the project has displaced 
some of the, you know, the difficult emotions and anxiety around it. And so I guess I learned that I, I, a part of what I feel like about anything I'm doing is the time that I spend with it is the physical time, but then there's also sometimes some, um, I'm spending time with it in my subconscious and a lot of things are being worked out and my understanding is deepening. So I feel like similarly to like when I, when I went to China and I shot a short film and I had to cast people and I didn't know what I was doing. And, you know, my cinematographer bailed at the last minute, a lot of crazy stuff happened, but on the other end of it, I felt like, I can do anything. I felt a level of fearlessness. I feel like getting this novel done, you know, saying I did the best I could, letting it go after this amount of time, there's going to be almost like a spiritual graduation of, wow, I did that. It didn't kill me. You know, I didn't, it's not my novel in the drawer. Cause that's sometimes an issue too. Some people go uncle and their novels in the drawer, you know? And um, so it's, I can do it. I, I, have the, I have the capacity, I have the talent, I have the vision to complete this and move on. I think that's, I think that's terrific. I mean, I think fortitude and endurance are key qualities in, in doing this kind of a lifestyle because, you know, I think many of us are drawn to writing and telling stories and then there's something about it. The, 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 I guess maybe the pressure of completion or the fear of not doing it well enough or telling, you know, comparing yourself to Emily Dickinson or Mark Twain or Toni Morrison or whomever that makes this whole process that much more challenging. Um, so now that you're nearing completion, what, I mean, are you going to start looking for an agent if you don't already have one? Are you, are you going to send it out? Are you going to, how, what, what would be the next steps for you along this particular path? Well, I'm starting to get the names of agents that I would like to send it to. I need to come up with a synopsis for it. I need to new, do a cover letter. And I think, I mean, I actually have written a cover letter previously. I've written a synopsis. So I want to go back and revisit those and see what I think of them, how the novel might have changed since the last time I wrote that, what understanding I've gotten about how to um, share it, uh, you know, how to, how to let folks know what it is and what they'd be getting and what the, why it matters. And I also am starting to, um, soon supposed to be working with uh, someone that you and I both know. She has a novel, I have a novel. We are going to come up with an agreement to read each other's novels, give each other feedback, and guidance towards the best polished version of, of, uh, of each of our projects. I think that's a great idea. I mean, I've talked about it here on Writing Daily before, but, you know, it wasn't that I wrote a first, second, and third draft and then started sending it out. Um, I sent it to, I mean, I, I wrote numerous drafts, uh, and then I gave it to other people that I respect, some people that I know well and some people I don't know well at all, mm -hmm. um, to kind of cultivate the best version of, uh, of the story as possible. And so obviously I'm, I'm, I'm gathering that this is an important, uh, important step and process for you. Right. And I'll probably reach out to you and some of the other people in our writing group and in our writing world to come up with like the best practices for this part of the journey. Uh, because, you know, I've, I've done some things along these lines before, but it's been a while and I need a refresher as to where things are now. Um, and even asking people who they think would be, you know, good agents. Part of what people suggest you do is to look at books that are similar to yours, read the back of them, see who their agents were. And, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a big part of the journey. I think a lot of times people think if they get to the end of the project, you know, if they build it, if you build it some, they will come and you got to show them where you are for them to come. They don't, they're not, they're not like, is there a novel on this street? You know, so you have to really kind of get your, get your butt together, you know? Yeah, no, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, here's the truth of the matter. It's very, very hard to do what you are doing. It's very hard to just create 
the work itself to, to get the novel done. But then the next step, I think, isn't quite, and, I, and I'm certainly not saying this is a discouragement to anybody who might be watching, it's that this is a continuing process. It's not that it's like I place my final period and then you're done and then somebody's just going to swoop down from the sky. It's right. a, you, have to, you have to go after the market. You have to go after the, the you know, the, and, I, and from what it sounds like, you're going to be going after agents, correct? Because some people, uh, you know, some people like to just go with, you know, see what's happening with a small press or, you know. One of the one of the twenty five you know, things so you can do. People, there's so many people in in the novel, like just this weekend, or I don't even know. Well, it's Tuesday. So over the last few days, I've been watching a lot of Mae West movies because my character was in a movie with Mae West. She was friends with Louis Armstrong. So there's a lot of people who I think make the book one that is a part, you know, it connects with the culture in a lot of different ways. And um, so, yeah, I will be looking for an agent who sort of gets the, gets the story, gets the value of it and can help me to get it out to the world. I'll explore really every avenue in terms of how it will be published, but that's my, that's my first plan of attack. I think I think it's wonderful. And if I if if I may ask you, is there a particular if you had one tip to deliver somebody who's looking in in engaging in sort of like a serious project like a, a novel, is there one per, you know uh, beyond endurance like that you just have to keep doing it? Is there a particular writing exercise or or thing that you do that helps your process uh, continue to succeed? <laughs> Well, I was, I was in a class um, some few years back at Long Beach City College, and one of the tasks that the instructor had us do was to write a desire line for our, our uh, character. So what's their desire at the beginning of the project, of the book, I should say? You know, how does that change? How do they get what they want? How do they not get what they want? So for me, I will probably go through uh, at a later point and look at that desire line so I really know what my character's going for um, at any given point in the novel, the desire line. So I, I don't know if I've really described it that well, but um, it stayed with me when I got, when I, when she gave us that assignment. Uh, along this desire line, does, does that mean you, you feel you know Hattie at this stage in the game? Or have a, a, an understanding of, of who she is? I feel like I have a better understanding. Uh, I think that, uh, yeah, I think I, I, in fact, I'm having to, again, sort of share what a black woman in the 1930s might be dealing with, with trying to contend with Hollywood. And not everything has necessarily progressed so, you know, uh, remarkably uh, in terms of the roles that are available to black women. But at the same time, there's still a lot that I think that people need to understand in a way where they don't judge her, you know. Oh, she did the stereotypical handkerchief head, you know, kind of thing. And I think that's my job is to bring her across in, you know, 2019, 2020 in a way that people will sort of understand what her what her challenges were can you repeat that last sentence again we had a little bit of an audio glitch and i want to make sure everybody gets it sure sure let me just yeah i was saying that my challenge in telling hattie mcdaniel's story in the way that i'm choosing to do it is that I want people to have compassion and understanding for the challenges she was up against in being an artist, a black woman artist in the 1930s. And uh, the, the roadblocks that she hit and the choices she made to survive, to be an artist rather than a maid, to and her, her mom and her sisters were laundresses. So they kind of went down the traditional path of black women in the era and she went left and she did what she 
uh, felt would fulfill her soul and for, fulfill her as an artist. And in that effort that she made, I feel like I have to make, make an equal uh, effort to represent that in a way that really honors her. I love that. And, and uh, a, couple, a couple last questions. Uh, is there any particular uh, author or book that you absolutely love that you want to kind of share with uh, uh, some folks when they're out at, the, at their local bookstore? Oh, wow. Um, what did I read? I read, I read uh, well, this is an old one, like an old favorite of mine is How the Garcia Girls Lost Their Accents. And um, it's by Julia Alvarez. And it's about three, I think it's three Dominican girls who came to the United States and the challenges they had in adapting uh, culturally. I thought that was really rich. Um, I really liked, uh, I don't remember know what this, this, this uh, author's name is, but I think it's called A Homegoing. And it's about two sisters. And I think one was um, raised in slavery and the other one was raised in Africa and, their, and how their past diverged. So those are a couple. That, I think that's great. And for, for somebody who's interested in learning more about you or, you know, uh, getting the lowdown of when uh, uh, your book about Hattie McDaniels uh, becomes available, uh, is there a way they can chase you down? Do you have a, a website or something? I have a website. I don't think anything's on it necessarily. I guess I have some, I do have some like black history blogging that I've done and I do have some, uh, some, some Hattie McDaniel, probably two or three blogs that relate to Hattie McDaniel. It's PamelaKJohnson.com. It's a, uh, it could be it could be updated the website, but right? you know there's some there's a few a few nuggets on there. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I hear you. This technology thing is is a drag. Yeah, like, uh, you know, yeah. yeah. We, we're, we're we're all doing the best that we can. This is a you know it's a complicated time to be a writer for sure. I think in many wonderful ways and some challenging ones as well. Anyway, yeah. Pamela. Yes, darling. Thank, thank you so much for joining me today. Sure, it means, sure. It's been great fun. I love having you here. And, thank you. Um, I'm going to be looking forward. I'm, I have a ringside seat, so I feel incredibly grateful for that opportunity. So we're, we're here. You and I are going to be talking more about writing books in the near future. And so if you want to get learn more about uh, Pamela, please visit her site, PamelaKJohnson.com. And uh, if you are, you know, obviously, if you like what we're doing, make sure that you hit the like button or the share button or hit the wow button or hit some kind of a button and let us know that you care. And every day we're going to be back here with Writing Daily. And you can always find me at devangalladay.com forward slash dad if you want to learn more about 10,000 miles with my dead father's ashes. Pamela, thank you again. And I yeah. will see you guys tomorrow with Writing Daily. All right.